what we perceive the value to be is what governs what we're emotionally prepared to pay. Episode 115. Hello and welcome to the Business of Architecture UK. I'm your host, Ryan Willard, and this week we are talking about the favourite of all architects. We're discussing fee proposals and joining me on Zoom in conversation all the way from San Francisco is design fee proposal expert, speaker and author, Ian Motley of Blue Turtle Consulting. So Ian has a background in project management, um, originally working as a fee proposal writer and negotiator for none other than Fosters and Partners. Um, He's co-authored five design fee and appointment guides that sell right around the world and he's been a keynote speaker at over 150 various architectural conferences and private sessions around the world and he is incredibly passionate about helping architects and design professionals write successful fee proposals. So in this conversation, Ian and I go deep into the world of fee proposal writing and the sort of common mistakes that architects will often make and how we can restructure them and how we can get the most out of presenting our fees. So sit back, relax and enjoy Ian Motley of Blue Turtle Consulting. So massive thank you to all of you for listening and supporting the Business of Architecture UK for the last couple of years. Big shout out to those of you who have come to our live events, attended the webinars, and of course to those of you who have downloaded the weekly podcast and have been listening to them on your bicycles. And as you know, we love helping architects win meaningful and profitable work, but it's not always that simple to implement these ideas or translate them into something that will work for you. So what I wanted to do was to to invite you onto a quick 15 minute chat with myself. We can both grab a cup of tea and I'd like to ask you about what content you found most valuable and why and what you'd like to hear more of. And I'd also love to hear more about your business, and what you're building at the moment and where you are headed to business wise in 2020. So there's no charge or any obligation with this call, just simply to find out how our content has been of value. And if we get that far and with your permission, of course, what might be next? What might be possible and how Business of Architecture UK could be supportive of that. Does that sound fair? Brilliant. So if you want to book a 15-minute chat with me, I'm calling these calls the BOA UK Discovery Call or just simply a chat with Ryan. Use the link in the information and I look forward to speaking to you. Ian, welcome to the Business of Architecture UK. How are you? I'm good, thank you. Thank you very much for inviting me. My pleasure. So you are um, an expert in proposal writing and negotiation within the architectural industry. And you've had a career previously, you were working for Fosters. And since then, you've, you've set up Blue Turtle um, with your partner. And it, it, you know, it's a really niche set of expertise that you developed. How, how did this yeah. begin? Okay. Um... Well, yeah, it's quite an interesting story. So probably about approximately 15 years ago, I went and joined Foster and Partners in London. Um, yep. I'm not an architect. I come from a project management background. Mm. I had spent the previous 10 years before working there, uh, working in the United States, managing construction loans. Um, so Foster and Partners were looking for some people to make or form a project management group uh, to write the fee proposals and negotiate the design fees, the terms, the conditions, on behalf of the office. So because of my international background, my project management experience, they offered me a job, uh, so I accepted. And, uh, and that was it. I was part of a small team that used to sit down with the design groups and we would go through the resourcing for the project, try and work out how much time we needed to complete work, what it would cost. Uh, we would then discuss you know, what we should propose as a fee. We'd use several different ways of measuring how we would do that. We'd then get the approval process through, through Norman Foster and everyone else. Um, and then write the proposal and send it to the client. And if we were lucky enough to be invited by that client to discuss our proposal, well, typically the project manager, uh, manager for, the, for the project and the design team captain, so the architect who was responsible for the project, typically those two people would go through that negotiation process together. And so I got to experience firsthand what it's like to meet with clients and try and sell design services. And while I was doing this, I got to meet who is now my, uh, my partner, my business partner, Alexandra Harrison. Yeah. She was an architect at Foster and Partners 
and she grew up in an architectural practice. Her dad is an architect, which is quite common in our industry. She had seen firsthand from a very early age just how challenging it can be to successfully run your own design firm. So when she met me and she realized that I just focused purely on the, the fees and negotiation side, she said, you know, you'd have a lot of success if you took what you did, package it up and sell it to small to medium sized design firms because mm -hmm. this knowledge, these concepts, these strategies that you talk about are not things that they typically learn during their formal academic training. Mm -hmm. So that's how it all started. Literally, it started over, you know, during lunchtime, just discussions about work and what we do and so forth. But uh, she managed me to convince me to go and start the company. So. <laughs> Uh, we did that 10 years ago. Um, she actually joined. She's a, she's a member of the, the team, um, very valuable member, I should say. Uh, and so, yeah, and, and that was it, basically. Fantastic. And, and how does the, the art of proposal writing, is it an art or is it a science? That's, that's the first question. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it, it, that's a very good question. No, it, it is a mixture. It, it's an art and a science. Basically, what we do as fee proposal experts is we try and learn and understand about behavioral finance. And behavioral finance is quite simply the way human beings behave in financial situations. Because since the early 1970s, there's been a lot of research in mm. this area. And prior to the 1970s, um, people generally thought that we all made logical and rational financial decisions. So when, when given a choice, people thought that we would weigh up the pros and cons and make a logical response to that request. Mm. But what they found in the 1970s is actually that's not how we work. We all have to take shortcuts in order to perform as human beings, in order to not, to not lose our marbles and to make sense of the world. We create these shortcuts and uh, we make financial decisions based on emotions or largely based on emotions rather than rational financial criteria. Mm -hmm. And this is summarized by the famous quote by uh, a professor at Harvard called Gerald Zoltman, who said 95% uh, of uh, financial decisions are based on emotional criteria, okay? And quite often you might hear neuro uh, neuroscientists saying, we, we buy with emotions and we justify with logic. Right. And that's because what we've learned over the last 30 years, 40 years is quite simply that we are very emotional creatures and we need things to feel right before we can say yes to them. So that's what we do. We specialize in that and we show you how that applies to your fee proposal. So in the context of an architect putting together a, a proposal for complex professional services, where is the scope to be able to put in an emotional argument, if you like, into something that is quite logical on the surface of it. How, yeah. do, how do we do that? Well, look, to, to, un, to answer that question, you really have to look at what we traditionally do and perhaps right. why that's not working. And that will explain why we need to take a more emotional approach. Mm. So to give you an example, traditionally as an architect, uh, and let's just take, say you're a small, or a small firm or a sole practitioner, Typically, you will wait for a client to call you up about one of their projects. And they will call you up and say, hey, I heard you're an architect. Um, I've heard some things about your work. We've got this project. You know, would you be interested? Are you too busy? You know, would you like to take a look at it? And the architect will typically respond by saying, you know, that sounds fantastic. Yes, we would like to take a look. Why don't we arrange a time to come out and meet you on site, you know, at your project location? Or, or if it's a very small project like an extension or an addition to an existing home, maybe we can meet you at your actual house, okay? Mm. When would you like to do that? And then they go and meet the client and typically this service is provided free of charge and they use that meeting to try and, you know, sell their services to impress the client on their knowledge, their, their CV, their, their workload, their portfolio, how they can help them and perhaps try and sell them a vision of how it will look. Yeah. And then inevitably at the end of that free meeting, the client will turn around to them and say, this sounds fantastic. Look, we're looking to work with you. We want to get started. Just one question. How much do you charge? Yeah. And the architect will typically respond by saying, well, look, I'm going to go back to my office. I'll run a few numbers and stuff and I'll get back to you with a fee proposal. Okay. So we go back to the office. We sit down. We think about the client. We think about the project. We think about how long it's going to take. We think about what we as a firm typically like to charge for this type of project. And also we try and marry that with what we think we can perhaps charge given the current financial or economic environment. Yeah. Right. And then 
based on those factors, we, we come up with a number. And that number, traditionally, that number would have been a percentage. So it would have been, you know, let's just say a round figure of 10% of the construction value, construction mm. cost of that project. And then we'll send that to the client. Now, traditionally, this process worked really well. And it worked really well for a number of reasons. Number one, prior to the 1970s, before the internet revolution, before technology took over, just to provide design services, you had to be able to draw. And so that significantly reduced the competition, the amount of people to be competing for that work, because you had to have that skill set, the, the, uh, the tools, the equipment, the knowledge to be actually able to draw these projects. So that eliminated a lot of the competition. The other thing is, you know, prior to the internet, geography limited the competition as well. You couldn't just Google something and find out what things cost all over the world. You needed somebody who was an expert to walk you through that whole process. So competition was very small. When the client got your proposal, uh, and, you know, we're not even mentioning fee scales at this point, but there were fee scales as well. So when the client got the proposal, they probably had a choice of maybe two, maybe three people in the local area that can actually qualify to do the work and actually do the work. And they would probably be charging very similar fees because of the fee scales. Yeah. So that process worked very well. The problem was that technology reduced uh, the scope of the architect's work, if you like, because technology allowed a lot more people to be able to have an involvement or, or a piece of the design pie, if you like. Mm -hmm. So nowadays, it's not a question of being able to draw because anyone with computer-aided uh, design software and so forth can start to take on that role. Yeah. The other problem is, is the geographical boundaries have come down. Now, whether you like it or not, even if you don't want to accept it, your client is still going to be able to Google things and find out what they cost, uh, and somebody can always do it cheaper. You know, yeah. There's always somebody that's it's more desperate uh, for work than somebody that's hungrier and they're always able to do it more affordably. Yeah. So that old approach of there's not a lot of competition. You're going to have to choose one of three of us. Here's our fees and they're all very similar. That has gone because of the technological revolution. So now people have a lot and access to a lot more information, a lot more data. Mm -hmm. And so they've got a lot more choice. So because of that, we need to start trying harder to win them over. To get them to say yes, we need to check a lot more boxes. Um, and that's how we start to appeal to the emotions of a client, is that we need to find out what's driving their decisions. And so that when we write our proposal, we cater to those drivers. Mm. You know, a little, a little bit like when you're designing a project. Yeah? You don't just go ahead and design something. You want to know how that client lives, what they're going to use it for, how they're going to work within it, what the spaces are going to be useful and so forth. So you can design specifically for that lifestyle or, or that office space or, or, or that commercial outfit, whatever it is. And it's the same thing with fee proposals. Now we know that how human beings respond to certain situations. We can write the proposal to address that criteria. Um, and if we don't do that, if we stick to the traditional model and if we give the client a fee, Mm. Uh, and traditionally, it would have been percentage, like 10%. But nowadays, our research shows us that approximately 60% of architects today, we did a study, I think it was two weeks ago we did a study, and 60% of approximately 100 people who responded to the study um, were offering lump sum fees nowadays. Right. So now we're seeing people are typically offering lump sum fees. So if you take that same traditional scenario, meet with a client free of charge, find out what they want, define the scope, go back, write a proposal, include your scope, and then give them a lump sum fee. And let's say that fee, just a round number, $10,000, for example. When the client gets that fee, they don't know if that's a good fee or a bad fee because they've never hired a design professional before, right? Yeah. yeah. So inevitably, to, to appease their emotional criteria, to feel good about saying yes, they need to check a number of mental boxes, if you like. Mm. And so one of those boxes is to make sure that that's a reasonable number. So in, in, inevitably, for them to emotionally think that that's reasonable, they need to compare it to other fee proposals. So they need to go and find some other people to put proposals forward. And that's when they start comparing. And inevitably, if they get a lower proposal, and so you're asking for 10,000, somebody else is asking for 6,000, automatically they start thinking, well, how can I get that 10,000 person to reduce their fee. Maybe if I told them somebody down the road here will do it for 6,000, they might you know, renegotiate. And they do this without any understanding of the work involved and the differences between the firms involved. 
Um, and so that's what we mean by emotional criteria. They're going to want to start negotiating that. So our traditional model was very useful back in the 70s and before, but now it's struggling to perform in this very highly competitive market. Yes. So now we need to know what are the emotional criteria, and, and it, you may be interested to learn, there's over 150 different what they call cognitive biases. And these are things that influence our purchasing behavior. And so when we can start to learn about some of them, then we can write the proposal and adapt it to those biases, mm. biases uh, to give us a lot more. What, 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 what sorts of things are those cognitive biases? So look, they, they come in a number of different groups. Some of them are very simple and easy to grasp. Some of them are slightly more technical. So if we start off with a simple one, uh, something you've all probably heard of, um, and that is that, as an example, testimonials, you know, knowing that you've worked with other people and they've been happy, make people more inclined to want to buy from you. So whenever you go to a restaurant nowadays, you'll probably Google it, Yelp it, something like that, and find out what other people are saying about that restaurant. Mm. Yeah. Now, if you live in the neighborhood and you've been to the restaurant a hundred times, you don't do that. If you know the restaurant owners, you don't do that. But if you're visiting a new town, you're doing something new, you're going to look on Yelp or an equivalent site, uh, Happy Cow or whatever, and, and see what other people are saying. Because if other people like it, you think to yourself, well, I'm more likely to like it as well if it's got a good review, right? Yeah. So that's one example of, of how we behave. And so um, that's perhaps one of the simpler examples. The other way is that the way we actually sort of respond to numbers. So if I gave you, um, if I gave you a fee proposal that includes just one number, so let's say I give you a fee proposal for the $10,000, the round lump sum fee, right? You as a human being have never hired an architect. Yeah. So you don't know if that's a good fee or a bad fee. You don't know how to feel about it because you've got nothing to compare it to. So inevitably, you're going to solicit other proposals, right? But if I changed my approach and I gave you three options, one of the options was an $8,000 service, one was a $10,000 service, and one was a $12,000 service, as a human being, your next question is not, what are other people charging? Let me get another proposal. Your next question to yourself is, why do I have three options here? What are the differences? Yes. Okay. And so automatically, as a human being, you start to want to understand what are the differences in service? So all of a sudden, you're starting to learn that there isn't one way to design this project. There's many different ways, and here's three options for my consideration. And let me just take a little bit more time to learn about the differences between those options and how I feel about them. Now, you, you may go and solicit a proposal from somebody else, but you're not so quick to go and solicit a proposal from somebody else because yeah. you want to learn more. And this is, as design professionals, this is what we want people to do. We want them to understand why we are special, what Got makes it. us different, why they want to hire us. And that's just one example of how we do that. So, so it's almost ca you're creating the parameters of the price contrast, essentially, rather than people going outside. And, you know, I mean, I was, I was speaking to a friend of mine recently who was looking to hire an architect. He'd done exactly that. He'd gone and approached maybe four or five different architects. And he couldn't even tell the difference between a, you know, a sort of architect that was based up in the swanky part of town compared to the local guy that was a, a CAD drawer, essentially. But the prices were enormous. But from the exactly. proposals that he'd received from, but he, it was, it was staggering. And it ended up, he ended up saying something to me, um, which was very telling. He just said, I don't trust. And now I don't know who to trust. Exactly. Exactly. His emotions yeah. are saying, I'm confused. I feel uncomfortable. Yes. Because of the way this is presented. Yeah. yeah. This, this, is, this is very common. This is, this is the problem. What, what a good proposal does is it makes somebody feel confident right. in, in hiring you and moving forward. That's, that's the aim of a successful fee proposal. It's to give the client confidence. What other sorts of things then are we as architects leaving, leaving out? Because obviously, you know, when, we, when we're putting together uh, you know, a kind of matrix, if you like, of price tiers or price banding. I've heard lots of, you know, lots of architects yeah. uh, have started to do this and found it very, have found it very effective and it can prevent things like scope creep. You know, there's never an argument about, you know, exactly. here's, well, here's what you get in the premium service. If you want that, then you've got to charge extra. What, what are other sorts of gray areas are architects leaving out in, in proposals? Um, well, look, the, the other perhaps 
one of the other big challenges is we've, as architects, we've um, all been trained to do things a certain way and we've very focused on the design of the project. Mm. That's why we got into architecture. That's what we like. So when it comes to the proposal, we have a tendency to perhaps download a document that's provided by one of the, the institutes, uh, perhaps take a document we've used with a previous employer and we're kind of saying, you know, this is something I've got to do. I've got to fill out this paperwork and send it to the client. Um, and the problem is, is that document wasn't written for that client. Mm. It wasn't written to sell your services. It was written by a lawyer to protect <laughs> your interests as a service provider. So yeah. typically this document, you know, it can be anywhere, depending on where you work um, and what area of the industry you're in. It, it, this document can be anywhere from five pages to maybe 20, 30 pages long, yeah? And typically it takes a similar format. The start of the, the, the document is the scope of work that's gonna be done. Somewhere in the middle is the actual fee you're gonna be charging towards the end, tends to be the terms and conditions, mm. in terms of payment, your copyright clauses, all these sorts of things. Now, as a client, when you receive that document, it's very legally onerous. It's very, uh, it's throwing a lot of responsibility on you. It's throwing a lot of weight on you as a client and things you're gonna to have to accept. You know, um, payment terms you're gonna to have to accept, so risk you're gonna to have to accept, liability you're gonna to have to accept, and all these sorts of things. So it's not designed to sell a design service, yet we are all tend to be using that to sell the design service. Right. Ironically, yeah. So one of the other things we can do, one of the other things most people perhaps are missing, is to not start with a heavy, legally onerous document, but instead, make it a simple, easy to read, easy to understand, feel good document that references your contract, yep. but isn't part of the contract. Okay. Um, and that way we can, it's a much more gentle approach to kind of saying we provide design services. We specialize in, in the type of work that you're looking to purchase from us. And here's what we can do for you. And here's how much it would cost. Now, if you're interested in any of these options, we also have a contract you may want to look at, and that is available upon your request. So we're not omitting the contract, we're not re removing it, we're not taking out all these onerous terms and conditions. All we're doing is changing the way in which we present it and deliver it to the client. And we're slowing down that process for them. Got it, got it. So it's kind of making something a lot more palatable and almost reaching the, you know, meeting the client where they're at, as opposed to kind of just going straight in with one of these, you know, your, exactly. your, your typical. We, we often use a dating analogy to explain this scenario. Like if you were single in the market to try and find yourself a life partner, you're in your coffee shop, you look across the room, you see somebody it's attractive. Yeah. Typically you won't go and approach <laughs> them and invite them on holiday for you in that first meeting. Right. Yeah. Typically you're going to start off with a much smaller commitment, a little bit of information, and perhaps invite them for a coffee. Yeah, if you can get them to make a small commitment, get that coffee and sit down and have a chat. During that meeting, if things are going well, you might try and get a phone number, an email address, some way of contacting them in the future. So innately, we all have this, this knowledge to kind of slow down these things and take it in small baby steps. When it comes to business, however, because we're selling the service, we want it done. We want to start work. We want to get them signed up. So as service providers, we have a tendency to rush the process and put too much information on the client too early on in that relationship. So in, how does that look like in terms of how we present um, a, like an architectural service? Are you suggesting that we perhaps we break down the service into smaller chunks of work or rather than sort of going in with the full fee, we, set, we sort of we kind of present stages or chunks of, of uh, services or... So look, there's not one strategy for every single design firm out there. It depends. But what we need to do is learn about the different models, if you like. Right. And then we can pick the best model that's suitable for, for that design professional, that architect. But look, in general, the general concept is this. We want to start off with a very small commitment. So if we go back to the dating analogy, our first step when we see that attractive person is to just simply engage in conversation. Will they talk to us? Okay. Will they actually respond to our questions? Can we drum up some sort of conversation? And then if we can drum up a conversation, is it appropriate to ask them if they'd like a coffee, you know, to buy them a coffee, for example. And the same thing should happen in business. So the first thing we want to do is drum up a conversation with, 
our potential clients. We want to know who our potential clients are, what do they look like, how can we reach them, and let's try and drum up uh, a conversation about design and how we can help them, okay? Yeah. Nowadays, you'll see this quite a lot with people doing blog posts, articles, that sort of thing. It's also very uh, successful strategy is to give presentations, to, uh, to do that type of thing where you're, you're up in an audience explaining how you can help them and, and the benefits of that. So that's the first thing. The second step is before we ever offer to design the building or do anything else for them, before we put our proposal on the table, is we need to start off with a, another small commitment. It's a pre-designed service. So once we've got the dialogue open, they're interested, they're talking to us, a little bit like, but can we buy you a cup of coffee? Would that be okay? Would you like, you've got five minutes to have a chat. Once we've got, you know, the initial discussions going well, we need to say to them, well, look, this looks like a fantastic project. Would you be interested in, depending on the project, in a pre-designed service, like a feasibility study or a master planning service, or for example, um, a space planning service, if it's an interior design project, you know, um, or a life cycle costing analysis or something mm. if, if it's a commercial client. So is there something we can do that's gonna solve some of your goals early on before we even get into that, what are we actually designing thing? Because we need to take the journey slowly. So that's the first thing is to try and introduce that small concept at the start, yes. that small service so we can exchange that commitment, okay? Yeah. And typically that small service should have some level of commitment from them. Yeah. Okay, so by that, I mean financial commitment is good. Um, so if they can pay you for a master planning study, if they can pay you for, you know, a, a feasibility study or a workshopping session or something like that, that's, that's very good. And the reason you want that commitment is because without it, then it's just you working for them for free. Yeah. And they have no obligation to you. What you're trying to get is them to make a commitment to you of their time, their effort, and hopefully a bit of financial resource as well. Absolutely. I mean, it's, it's, it's very interesting. Obviously, you know, the work with architects do with um, commercial developers, there's often a lot of front end appraisal work that goes done for free. Um, or, or even a site visit is a, you know, that's often turns into a sort of mini consultation for which the architect is not paid for and not paid for their time. And these, these over time can accumulate and become very yeah. expensive ways of courting, if you like, trying to, trying to bag the project, which end up exactly. going nowhere. So actually training the client or, or setting up a, a parity in the relationship by getting them to make a commitment. I, I guess as well, by getting them to make that commitment, they're more likely to move on to the bigger stage, the next stage with you. It kind of makes it more palatable in a way. Yeah, yeah. There's something called the principle of consistency and commitments. Um, and basically it means that as human beings, once we commit in one direction, uh, we tend to like to follow that direction because mm. we want to confirm that the commitment we made was a good idea. And so we want to kind of follow it through. Um, and it's, it's something called the principle of consistency and commitments. And look, of course, you'll see other industries all do this, right? For example, you know, if you go and hire a, a real estate agent, you might not be paying them any money up front, but you have to sign, usually have to sign some sort of an agreement with them that you're gonna work exclusively so they can go and spend their free time finding you a home, yeah. but they will actually get the commission once you go ahead and purchase. So they make you sign a contract. So once again, you might decide as a design professional, uh, you know, like if you're an interior designer and perhaps you've gotta do space planning design work free of charge, then you might say, well, look, I can't charge for this, otherwise they'll just go to the, an, another interior design firm. And I wanna get the opportunity. So you might be able to say, look, you don't have to pay me, I'll do the space planning, but I would like, um, an exclusivity arrangement with you that should this thing proceed that I will have exclusive rights to do, to do the following work on from there um, or first right of refusal. So there are other ways to exchange, exchange commitments. It doesn't have to be financial. Got it. Uh, financial is typically the simplest, the easiest way. Got it. So, so some form of exchange, some form of commitment actually can, can go along to being the first sort of parts of, of forming this kind of relationship. Yeah. Like if we go back to the dating analogy, for example, if you ask that, 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 that girl or that guy in the coffee shop, hey, can I buy you a coffee? You'd be very upset if you bought them a coffee and they walked out the door and down the road with it. Yeah. <laughs> what you're really saying is if you're prepared to commit a little bit of your time to sit here and talk with me and get to know each other, 
I can be prepared to commit to buying you a coffee. So that's what we're really looking for is that exchange. And it's the same thing in business. Got it. How, how does it differ from smaller practice in your experience, having worked at, uh, you know, one of these hugely successful practices like, like Foster's, who's obviously working with titans of industry from Bloomberg to Steve Jobs. How does their process then um, differ or is similar to what you're doing with smaller or medium sized practices? Or is that, you know, very much the same in terms of, yeah, in terms of yeah. that proposal? So it's very interesting. Um, you know, over the last 10 years, we've worked predominantly with small to medium sized firms. Yeah. And, you know, a very common question we get asked is, well, surely when you work for Foster and Partners, people just want to hire you, right? Because you're Foster and Partners. So you don't have to negotiate for you, tell them the fee and they accept it, right? Mm. And that's not how it works there, because obviously they're not the only star architect in town. In fact, there's a lot of star architects around. So yeah. we would always be competing with the Zaha Hadids, with Richard Rogers, and so forth. There's still competition at every level in the industry. Mm. And the other thing we find is that the higher up that sort of pyramid you get and the closer to the pinnacle, the top you get, the more uh, experienced, the, the more aggressive, the more better these people are at negotiating. Um, yeah. So, you know, they're, they're professional negotiators. So it's, it's the same principles we're all applying, but it's at a, it's at a very high-end uh, level. So it's actually, perhaps in some respects, slightly more challenging. Um, so what I is, tend to is, tell, is this in, in terms of the clients or in terms of the architects or both? In terms of the clients. I mean, yeah. to give you an example, I could sit down in a, in a meeting to discuss our fee proposal and literally face a wall of personnel from the client side, which includes lawyers, accountants, project managers, and so forth. And they can literally work sort of tag team. So I get 10 minutes with this guy or girl, and then, you know, they excuse themselves. The next one comes in, the conversation starts again and so forth. And it can be very, very challenging to manage. So if I could say anything on the subject, I would say, you know, it, it is a lot easier to negotiate and to work perhaps at the smaller level because it's a lot less sophisticated people are a lot less professional at the negotiation process so in theory this it's the same principles you're using but it should be in theory easier at the, at the kind of more affordable level got it and this idea of negotiating because obviously a lot of uh, you know my experience of with working with architects is what tends to happen is that proposal writing gets done and it's like you gave the example at the beginning it, it, it gets done after an initial conversation or there's a lot of it that's done in emails back and forth, or there is a, you know, a proposal that's sent out afterwards. And the idea of, of negotiating, no, negotiating kind of suggests, or you know, the sort of traditional idea you might have of it is people being face to face and discussing things. Is there a, a way or that is preferential or more advantageous by in the, the way that you present your proposals? Like does doing things face to face make a difference? Or is it better to be sending things? Yeah, so there's pros and cons. When it comes to negotiating, my experience has been there's pros and cons to each. So to give you an example, yeah. when you're sat down with somebody, you can read a lot about their tonality, their facial expression. And half the reason you can read so much is it's honest because they don't have time to hide anything. They don't have time to go away and think about it. So you get an immediate reaction, an immediate response. Mm. Okay. The problem, of course, is you too are going to be honest, whether you want to or not. So you're going to give an immediate reaction. You're going to give immediate response. There's also the stress of being trying to get along and, and keep things going in a positive direction. So time becomes much more critical face to face. Mm. Um, so all these factors tend to play into it. So uh, it's a lot easier face to face to agree to things that in the long run you wouldn't agree to. But it's, yeah. in, in the heat of the moment, you agreed to it because you wanted to get along and you wanted thought it was a good idea. But later on, you look back and reflect upon it and think that was not a good idea. Yes. So, so these are the problems. Now, when you go to the email route, it gives everyone a lot of opportunity to read it, go away, sleep on it, think about it, come back with something else. So it can be a lot more challenging to actually reach an agreement because you're not able to read each other. You're not able to get an honest response. A lot can be hidden. So my personal preference, depending on my situation, depending on my positioning for the negotiation, my personal preference would usually be to, to at least sit like we are today. So we can't be in the same room, but we can see each other yeah. in real time 
and see how you're responding to the issues. So mm. that would be my, my preference if I had a choice. Got it. Got it. And that, that gives you the ability to be able to, you know, obviously if you've gone in there prepared as well with the proposal and it gives you the opportunity to, you know, if a client has objections to certain elements of it or, or questions that at least you're there to be able to, to field them. Cause often, you know, the, yeah. the, the kind of classic thing that happens with, with architects when they make proposals is you send a proposal out and then you never hear from the, the client again. And, you know, you're never right, really, yeah. you're never really sure what, what quite has happened to the proposal. Exactly, exactly. And when you're sat down with a client, you will know, you'll, be, you'll just be able to feel the atmosphere in the room. I mean, people, people give off a frequency, they give off vibrations, and you, you can feel it in the room, whether they're kind of uncomfortable, uh, you know, whether they have uh, an intention to actually, you know, whether they're trying to work with you and trying to find a solution, or whether they're just kind of being very, you know, binary about it and saying, well, that's the number we've got to meet. Uh, if you can do it, you've got a job, but if you don't, and you, you know, you can see, is that really their position or is that, you know, what's going on? You can also see if, if you're there in the room with a, with a group of people, you can see who's really making the decisions. Well, perhaps nobody in the room is making the decisions, but you can see what the hierarchy is in that group, which also can help things. So yeah, there's a lot that can be read when you're, you're, you can see them. Right. And, and what are the sort of the fundamental things that need to be included in a good proposal? So, well, it's interesting. Um, I mean, we, we often obviously offer a workshop course on this and, and we, we take a day to explain exactly what you should put in and why you should put it in right. there. Um, so there's not just one thing. There's, a, there's, a, you know, there's 150 cognitive biases. There's a minimum of 15 things we would recommend um, that you put into your proposal or at least consider the consequences. Um, and they include things like you know, for example, testimonies is a very simple and easy one. Um, but there's things like losses and gains, you know, losses hurt more than gains, please. So you've got to be able to frame the loss and the gain in the, in the services you're offering. You, you can't do that if you're offering a single fee, single service. You can only frame losses and gains if you're offering a variety of different services. Okay. Right. Um, I don't know if that makes sense. If it doesn't, <laughs> you can ask me more about that. Yeah. It, it, yeah. What do you mean? <laughs> you talking about like a kind of a menu of different services and then and then saying here's if you if you if you do this part of the service and don't do this then here's the risk that you're taking on essentially exactly exactly so if we go back to the research right um as human beings we are affected emotionally we're affected more by losing something than we are by actually gaining something and the, right. and the classic example to explain how this works is if I invited you to have a bet with me, right? And I have a coin and I'm going to flick the coin. And I said, you know, if it's heads, you're going to win $100, right? But if it's tails, sorry, if it's heads, you're going to lose $100. But if it's tails, you'll win. Now, how much do you want to win in order to accept this bet? So you don't have to have the bet, but if you're going to do this bet, what do you want to be able to win? You know, and typically you'll want to want to be able to win more than the 100 you could lose. So you're right. saying, in order to take the risk, the gains have to be that much better than the loss than the, than the losses, right? So typically, people would want double. Typically, people say, I want an opportunity to win $200 if I may lose $100, right? And you see this in all areas of, of business. So for example, if you're going to spend money on advertising, right? And somebody says, oh, it's going to cost you $1,000 to advertise your architectural service in our weekly newsletter or, or whatever it is. Mm. So you're thinking to yourself, well, if I go to the effort of putting in that advert and everything, and at the end of the day, all I get out of it is one single feasibility study that costs me $1,000. Well, you know, I'm going to break even. I'm not going to bother doing that. Now, if I can get something that creates $1,500, well, I'm slightly interested. By $2,000, oh, now I'm, I'm putting in $1,000 but getting $2,000 back. Now I'm starting to get interested. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. So, yeah. It, so it affects all that. Um, all aspects of life. So how that responds to our fee proposal is that when we're offering service options, just like you said, we need to show the client what our basic service includes, the, the gains, but we also need to show them what it excludes. It doesn't have the losses, but what they can have if they would like. Right. So we're not saying you can't have these losses. We're saying you can, but there's an additional fee to pay for that. Yeah. So other industries are really good at doing this. So for example, you know, if you take things like uh, airlines, right, they provide um, a service, you know, transport service for you. 
and they give you a class system. It's you know economy, business, and first class. Or it used to be economy, business, first class. They've realized framing the loss is so powerful that they've introduced more classes. So there's economy, there's economy plus, you know, there's 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 now business, there's there's sort of business plus and all these things because they've realized it's much more beneficial to allow people to make their own choice and give them an incentive to spend more rather than telling them, oh, you can only have a business class seat. That's all we've got. Yeah. Right. So that's how you frame the loss. And, and, and how, does this, how does this translate to, and I, I suppose as a, when you're going into proposal situation, your research is kind of critical or those initial conversations that you have with the client to establish what are their, let's call them pain points, for example, what are the, yeah. emotion, what are the emotional drivers? You've got to be relatively skilled to be able to get those out because you want to need those to be able to frame these gains and losses in your proposal. So if you haven't done that bit of the process, it's going to be difficult. Or can you just make assumptions? So look, first thing we would recommend, if you are a sole practitioner or if you're a small firm, then the first thing you need to do is specialize. Okay. okay. So you need, you need to choose a niche within the market to specialize in. And there's a number of reasons why you should do this. Um, but the, the main reason behind specializing is because if you can become the expert, if you can become known as the person that does that, whatever you do the best, then people pay you a premium fee for it. People pay for experts because experts reduce their risk, their burden, their responsibility. So they'll do that. This plays out very well in other industries. For example, in the, in the uh, medical industry, um, doctors who specialize here in the United States they get paid on average 40% more than a doctor who is just a general practitioner. Yeah. Uh, doctors are a very good case study because it's very easy to track what they get paid, how they get paid, and what uh, they specialize in. It's, it's a very black and white issue. So that's, you know, that's a 40% increase. So the first thing you need to do is specialize. And the, re the other reason you need to do this is because then you can get very good at offering your service options because you're doing one thing and you're doing it very well. You know, if, if each week I'm trying to cater to a different client, so one week I'm doing an addition on an existing home, the next week I'm doing a brand new family home, the week after that I'm doing a school, and then I've got to go and do an opera house and then a, a petrol station and so forth, it's going to be very different in each scenario to know exactly what that client's um, interests are. However, having said that, there are general trends. So we can group clients into two broad big categories. The first is a commercial client, somebody who is building for profit, has different motivations, different drivers to a, a residential client who's somebody who's building for personal taste. So the first thing we can do is separate these and say commercial clients want to make money. How can we, with our service, help them achieve that goal? Residential clients are building for personal taste. They're building for a dream. They're trying to realize a dream. They want something to be proud of. How can we create options to help fuel that driver okay so that that's how we, if we were going to specialize uh, sorry if we weren't going to specialize and we were going to offer services to a broad spectrum of clients then first of all we can group them into commercial and non-commercial clients right okay and then they've got they that you, you can be quite clear on the, the different motivations behind each yes yeah brilliant and um fantastic well i, I think there's there's so much more i could ask you uh about i kind of think this is we're kind of coming to a place to conclude the conversation. Um, if people want to work with you, um, what, what sorts of offerings do Blue Turtle, how do you work with clients? So look, the, the, um, there's three levels we offer three <laughs> options. Okay? We, we practice exactly what we preach. Yeah. Um, and so the simplest thing to do, if, if this is an area of subject matter that interests you, um, but you're not losing projects, you're not, you know, hankering to change exactly what you're doing, but you've got an interest in behavioral finance. You've got an interest in learning how to write proposals. Uh, and maybe it's because you're running a firm and you're like, you know, I do okay, but could I do better? Yeah. Or maybe it's because you're actually working for a big firm, but you're thinking, you know, I'm getting paid what everyone else gets paid. I don't want to do that. I want to get paid more than what other people get paid. I need to specialize. I'm going to stay with the firm, this big firm, but I need to specialize within this firm. Mm. So that I become the go-to person. So for example, you know, I made a, a nice living out of being the fee proposal person in the firm. You know, yeah. I was one of a small group of people. But if you marry up, you know, a project manager who specializes in fee proposals and the experience level compared to perhaps an architect who has no specialization, 
I think you'll typically find that typically that project manager will, will be getting paid a premium because yeah. they're delivering a niche service. So if you have an interest in it, the easiest thing you can do is go to our website and we post free articles and you can register and you can get one article delivered to you every week. And over a period of 52 weeks, you can build your knowledge on these subjects of negotiation, human behavior, behavioral finance, and how to write fee proposals. Uh, it's free, it's simple, and they're little bite-sized chunks. So you can read each article in literally two or three minutes. And you can also you know, write a question at the bottom below. The next step up, if you've, if you've done that or you don't have time to do that or you don't want to do that, uh, the next step up is to take the online fee proposal workshop training course. Right. It is now, since COVID, it's now delivered online and it's a mixture of recorded and live training. So the recorded, there's nine recorded uh, modules. Each module discusses a different aspect of what we've been talking about today. So there's fee psychology. There's fee negotiations, there's pricing models, pricing design services, there's how to write a successful proposal, there's common errors, there's case studies. So that's what the nine are about. And you can stop, start, rewind, you can watch those training courses at your level, you've got complete access. But to help support that learning, every other week, we offer an online um, Q&A session, which we conduct via Zoom like this. So you can come online with us live you can see what your peers, what your colleagues, your co-workers in the industry are asking us. Right. You can also ask us your own questions. Brilliant. And have us give you a live response, an honest live response um, to that question. You can also fire uh, your questions in early if you want. You might not. You know, there's usually um, a list of questions we get beforehand as people, we get close to the event and people want their questions on the table. So if you want to make sure we have your question, you can fire it in early and we will address it for you. Um, so that's the second way. And that's an online training course. You can take it at your leisure. You can take it as quickly, as slowly as you like. The third and, and final option we offer is one-on-one -on -one consulting where we right. work with you. Um, and that is tailor-made to your needs. So if you need to talk with us once a week about your current situation, your negotiation position, what's going on, you need our feedback, we can do that. If you need us to review your proposal and give you some honest criticism on where it could be improved, then we can do that for you. So that's the consulting service. Excellent. Oh, that, that's, that's, that's brilliant. And I can, it's a real deep set of expertise that you guys have, have, have been developing that's, um, absolutely fascinating and particularly the, the sort of the behavioral economics behind it or the behavioral uh, psychology behind what actually makes people make purchasing decisions so this is the sort of perennial problem in architecture is you know why are our fees so so low and a lot of it is just that we're not negotiating properly we're not we're not presenting yeah. uh, and communicating value and it's a it's a, there are lots of foundational principles that are incredibly important for us to be learning. Yeah, I'll leave you with one last one, which is, you know, immensely powerful. I can never quite describe quite how powerful this, but what we are prepared to pay for products and services is, is fundamentally um, persuaded or, or influenced by the perception of that product or service. So perception of it governs price. Our perceive, what we perceive the value to be is what governs what we're emotionally prepared to pay. So uh, a lot of times architects, interior designers and, and building designers and so forth all focus their attention on the design. We do great quality design service. You know, it's really high end. Uh, why aren't clients paying us the money that we deserve? And why aren't they paying us a reasonable fee for this? And it's because of the perceived value. It's the perception of, of what you do. And once again, this is why specialization is really key. When you can specialize and you become known as the expert, People don't concern themselves so much with what it's going to cost them uh, because they know you can deliver it and they know you're the person to go to. So, yeah, there will be negotiation, but it won't be quite as heavy as if you're just a regular, you know, design professional in the industry trying to compete with all the other regular design professionals. Yeah, absolutely. Brilliant. Ian, thank you so much for your contribution and your expertise on this conversation. It's been... Thank, thank you so much for inviting me. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. And that's a wrap. Thank you so much for listening. And don't forget to book your 15 minute chat with me by using the link in the information. I look forward to speaking with you.
The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract bond or commitment except to help you be unstoppable.